Okay, so the agenda. We're going to be talking about why this is a big deal, how to get a referral, and then third, um, how we execute on the referral. So we'll be talking about the referral sequence and how you handle the call. So a lot of what I talk about is just like the straight cold outbound part of cold outbound where you're trying to reach out to somebody who you've never been in contact with before, and you're trying to get like some kind of reaction out of them. This is for that second phase. Like Once you've connected with someone on the phone, and they ask for information, hopefully you get a meeting instead of them asking for information, but how do you respond to someone when there needs to be follow-up? On an email or a call, what are the best practices? There are a lot of different things to do for different situations, as captured in this sheet. Actually, when I first became an SDR manager, I was like, okay, first thing I'm gonna do is make a mind map of every possible thing, every way you could respond to every possible response and in each situation. And I made this thing in Lucid Chart that looks like a bomb about to go off, right? We realized was, if you think about it, like 80 to 90% of the responses that an SDR needs to make really fall in about five different situations. So we went from my big, giant nuclear bomb explosion to just something as small as this. Our big thing at Outreach is we want our SDRs within a couple of weeks to have a holistic understanding of how to reach out in 90% of the situations. There's a big temptation to go for perfection, especially if you are a top performing SDR and there are so many ways things can get better. But if you're perfect in one area and you're off in another area, it's like, you can't have one weak link in the chain or the whole thing can go, to, go down. So make sure for each part of your onboarding program that you have the 80% of the results in as simple a way of pos as possible. Cool, so let's talk about referrals from prospects. So referrals from prospects is one type of response, but it's a type of response that's extremely important. For me, I got a third of my opportunities from referrals from prospects, a third. So I could barely, I could kind of hit quota just without doing this with the standard way of going outbound. But if I could get referrals from prospects when I was accidentally reaching out to the wrong person or in other situations, I could convert those at a really high rate and it increased the amount of opportunities they could create by 50%. Um, and that was consistent throughout, throughout my time as an SDR, a third of my opportunities came from that. What's really cool about this is it doesn't take any extra time. It's not like you need to dedicate a few extra hours to doing this little thing and it'll have a big return. This plugs right into pretty much anyone's existing workflow. We're gonna talk about why it works. So it's a big deal. There's a pie chart with a third because that's a third of my opportunities. Cool. The other thing that's cool about this is it works well with almost every industry and persona. So we sell to sales and marketing, but there's actually kind of a diverse group when you sell to sales and marketing, because salespeople are a certain way, marketing people are a certain way, sales ops people are a completely different way. So one thing that's really cool about this is it is especially effective with operations and IT roles. So when we cold call sales ops, it is very, very, very hard for us to get through, at least relative to marketing and salespeople. But if we can get through to sales ops, if we can get a meeting with sales ops, it's very, very, very valuable. So one thing that's really cool about the referral sequence is that it is especially effective with sales ops or IT types of personas. For whatever reason, they're just much more likely to follow through when you have been referred to that person. And I installed this with a couple of companies who reach out purely to IT. And in IT, they'll get like, 1% response rates to their emails in some cases. Really, really difficult. And then the direct dials are even worse. But when they installed this, they would get a 40% reply rate with the sequence, with that exact same persona. So if you're reaching out to IT or operations or anyone that's not quite in that sales marketing category, it's extremely valuable. So 54%. Is the reply rate that we get on the sequence. 54%. So the way this sequence works is I reach out to the wrong person and I realize they are in fact the wrong person. What I do is I say who should I be reaching out to and then I pause awkwardly until they respond. That's how you get it. 
Okay, so that was my whole thing. A lot of people have like these really complex ways of saying, hey, like maybe would it be okay if maybe I, I, I could reach out to someone, is that okay? You just like need to keep it simple and just ask who the person is, assume that they want to give it to you. Hopefully you've articulated your value well. And say, who should I be reaching out to? They give you that person's name. And you can put that person into a referral sequence that I'll introduce in a little bit. Once you have that person's name and you put them into the referral sequence, we get a 54% response rate. What's especially cool about this is that we have a firsthand validation that this person is not just a good person, but the right person. So we're getting firsthand validation that this is the right person and a response from them 54% of the time. Cool. So how do, we, how do we get a referral in the first place? So ask for a referral every time you realize you're talking to the wrong person. This is on the phone, and this is on email, OK? And in fact, so there are two situations when you're on the phone. When you're on the phone with someone who actually is the right person. So for us, this would be something like, I am talking to VP of sales, but he's thinking, you know what, this really should be with ops. He'll say, hey, I'm not the right person. The way I respond to that is I'll say, who should I be reaching out to in awkward pause? I will get that referral, and then I will say, wait, you're VP of sales, you're over multiple managers, right? Okay, awesome. You are the right person I should be reaching out to. So then you can kind of bank the referral, and then you don't lose anything, and then you can still reach out to that prospect that told you they weren't the right person. Does that make sense? So you can bank that referral, then you have a free play. So that's how I would play that. And then in a lot of situations, you call someone who says, for us, it's like, oh, it said sales director on their profile. I didn't realize that meant AE. In that situation, you just say, hey, who's the right person? Awkward pause, get their name. Cool. All right. So number one, ask for a referral every time you're talking to the wrong person. Phone call. You should get a referral most of the time. So in our new SDRs, I ask them how this is going. I say, OK, when you ask for a referral, about what percent of the time do you get it? If it's less than 50%, it is an issue with either their delivery, usually with their assertiveness and confidence. Okay, if you ask weekly, it doesn't quite work. If it's confidence, like you know this is valuable. You know that they want to tell their friend about this. Who should I be reaching out to? Most of the time, you'll get it. All right. So it's a good rule of thumb. OK, what if they actually are the right person? We've discussed that. Bank the referral first. Over email. So every time someone on email says, hey, I'm not the right person, there's still an opportunity to squeeze some juice out of this. Most people will just let this go. I have the same reply every time. It is like a sentence long, and I just say, hey, thanks for your honest response. Who should I be reaching out to? Okay. And then I'll use a FUP sequence, which is a whole other thing. Um, actually, I did a whole LinkedIn Live on FUP sequences the other day, which I highly recommend. So those are things that are non-referrals that you need to respond to. Actually, just as a show of hands, just out of my own curiosity, who has ever seen my face and my blue hair on LinkedIn before? Have I become? OK, good. So um, I do LinkedIn Lives every week. Last week, I did it about follow-ups. Everything outside of referrals is covered in that. I highly recommend you check it out. Cool. Um, so experiment with both top-down and bottom-up approaches to getting referrals. Who's read Predictable Revenue? Hopefully a lot of people. It's a good book. It was, kind of, it was very early on in the sales development stage. And one of the tactics that he talked about was reaching out to the CEO and saying, for example, who's responsible for making purchasing decisions for your sales tools? And you'd get a response from the CEO, and you use that referral from the CEO to get to that person. That's been really overplayed, but it also still kind of works. What a lot of people don't realize, though, is that the referral up is actually surprisingly effective. Has anyone seen this work? OK, wait, I'll explain what it is before I ask if you've seen it work a little more clearly. So you get a referral from someone, for example, I reach out to a sales rep. The sales rep says, hey, I'm not your person. Um, you'd want to talk to my manager. I reach out to the manager and say, hey, I talked with Lenny, one of your reps. He recommended that I reach out to you about this tool. Uh, would you have some time to chat? Has anyone seen that work going from the bottom up? 
Okay, some of you have. This is a lot less common than the top-down approach, but anyone who's seen it work can probably attest to the fact that it works surprisingly well. A lot more better than I would have expected. And the magical thing about this is instead of just having to work with the CEO down, you've got one CEO to go down from, managers have a lot of direct reports, so you have a lot more shots. This was kind of an untenable strategy before sales engagement platforms came out because it would be way too time consuming for the return you get. But with sales engagement platforms, you can actually reach out to quite a few different people um, and still get that referral up. So we'll reach out to our highest priority prospects with pretty call heavy sequences. Um, we use a sequence called the Agoji sequence. If you are using a sales engagement platform and you're not using the Agoji sequence, I highly recommend you do. If you take one thing from this whole conference, I have implemented that with a lot of companies that have not been using it previously, and I have not had a situation where they have not seen a significant increase in their outbound um, effectiveness. So if you're not using the Agoji sequence, go ahead and use it. So, A-G-O-G-E, and you can just Google it. Uh, it's pretty easy to find. Cool, so those are for our most important prospects. There's this other group of prospects that is not necessarily worth ignoring, but not necessarily worth laying a bunch of cold calls on. You wanna save those for your most important prospects. You can give them a stripped down version of your sequence without many manual steps, or you can try out making a sequence purely asking for a referral. This works much better with some companies than others, um, but for us it's been surprisingly effective. Like if you sell sales tools, um, salespeople sometimes get a bad rap, but salespeople are surprisingly likely to help each other out, you'll find. Um, and so something to think about and something to A-B test. Cool. So we have, if anyone's seen my content about the Goji playbook, we have mapped out the type of people that we would put in a sequence just asking for a referral. And you, can, you can Google a Goji playbook too and find that pretty easily. Okay, referrals from the bottom up are surprisingly effective. Okay, executing on the referral. This is what the referral sequence looks like. Okay, it's a manual email. And um, one thing that's kind of interesting, I think most people disagree with me on this, but I can't hang it anyway because the data so clearly proved that it works. Um, so we do this in the Agoji sequence too, where we'll write a manual email where we'll customize the first line. Like if you're ever writing emails, we've tried having SDRs customize the entire email and we've measured response and open rates, and then we've had SDRs just focus on getting that first couple of lines. And the results between the two are not all that different. And the reason for that is that when your prospect is deciding if they're gonna open the email or not, they see the subject line in the first line, okay? So, you wanna invest heavily on the first part of the email. Also, by cutting it, you can cut out like 80% of the time that they waste on customization too. Okay, so the referral sequence, the copy we use is basically just like aggressively name dropping that person that gave you the referral, right? That's the first, that's the first line of that, and we ask them for a meeting. And then we'll do a couple of replies that are just short one-line things that are short enough that when they open it, they can still see that first customized line with the name drop really quickly, all right? And we'll run that play twice. Um, this takes no time on the SDR, and both of these will get a higher response rate than the time-consuming manual email did in the first place. It's magic, okay? So we'll go ahead and use that. We have a couple of emails just about our t traditional value prop for SDRs, phone calls, and a Hail Mary email. Awesome. So yeah, we get most out of the initial name drop, and then we will use traditional but short prospecting emails. Another just tip on emails is we went and did this, I went to a sales kickoff with someone and I was part of this like game where you had to figure out which email had the highest response rate and they had a whole bunch of different emails talking about value propositions in different ways and a bunch of different strategies. And um, People were like guessing and getting them right, getting them wrong, and like people were talking about why this may or may not be the case. 
And I was sitting in the back, and we had gone through 20 of these head-to-heads. I said, did, did anyone else notice that the winner of every single one of those 20 was the shorter email? So all else being equal, keep your emails as short and to the point as possible. Okay? You're not writing a college paper where you get points for length. You want to get their attention with personalization, and you want to articulate your value prop in the shortest amount of space possible, and then ask for a meeting. All right? Cool. Oh, and then the breakup email. Um, I was going to avoid discussion about that, but I'll discuss it anyway. So breakup email is a little bit of a misnomer. Has anyone heard that term before? So it's called the breakup email because SDRs are really bad at naming things. I think there's like a million names for the SDR function. There's like SDRs, ZBRs, CDRs, CDMs, BDRs, LDRs, SDRs, ADRs, LDRs. Um, lots of different names for SDRs, lots of different names for everything. We still haven't figured out naming things in our industry yet, which will come. But, um, so the breakup email is a misnomer because if we've gotten to this point in the sequence, there is literally no relationship to break up with. We've just gotten to a point where they haven't responded to any of our phone calls or any of our emails. And so at the end of the sequence, we try something completely different. In fact, at least at Outreach, we call it the Hail Mary email. Who's familiar with the Hail Mary in football? OK, the Hail Mary, if you're not familiar with what it is, is an objectively bad play in most situations in football. Right? It's usually the wrong call to hail, call the Hail Mary. But in certain situations where you have very little to lose, it's actually a calculated play. So we'll do a Hail Mary email at the end with something that is totally different than what has not worked. Maybe it's something funny. Um, really, it ends up just being like the same joke over and over. And I've heard the same joke a billion times, and it's really not funny to me. But people still respond to it, and so we still use it. You have to make sure that you are, your data is your master, not your personal feelings. Because a lot of stuff that works is stuff that would not work with me. But that's not important. Um, so yeah, something funny, something um, totally unexpected, something unusually assertive also can be useful too. People expect SDRs to be like kind of like beggars, like, hey, like maybe could you please get back to me? If you're like, look, I know that this is going to change your whole workflow. I know because I've used it. Like, we seriously need to talk. Like, I've been reaching out like crazy for a reason. Um, sometimes that kind of a tone is unexpected and it's um, it's received well. Depends on the industry, um, but it's worth trying. It's worth experimenting on. Um, the great thing about the Hail Mary part of a sequence is that you don't have a whole lot to lose, and so you can kind of have fun with it. Right? You can take some risk, see what works. <sighs> Lastly, a referral is a workflow stopping event. I advise my SDRs to do things in as long of chunks as possible. We don't do like, OK, let's do 15 minutes of this, 15 minutes of that. Like Every time you're trying to get into the flow of either sequencing or calling, there's a little bit of a ramp. Okay? So you want to do things in long chunks, ramp up, and just like crush through it. I do not like being interrupted. You interrupt me while I was an SDR in the middle of sequencing, and you get my, you get my crazy eyes. No one wants to see my crazy eyes. So what I did, my trick for that was I would just wear big Beats headphones and no one ever interrupted me. So even with that being the case, so I feel really strongly about staying in workflows for as long as possible, um, a referral is a workflow stopping event. If you're in your call flow and you're making calls and you get a referral, you stop everything you're doing and you reach out, you try to call that person first the next two minutes and say, hey, I just got off the phone with Jim, or whatever it is. And if you can't get through to them, put them into the referral sequence saying, hey, I just got off the phone with whoever. Okay, It's a workflow stopping event. That's how important referrals are. Cool. What do I say when I call? So what do you say when you call? So you are reaching out to someone who's in a referral sequence, and you just say, hey, I connected with Jim. He recommended that I reach out with you, to you about outreach. Um, would you have some time tomorrow at 9? Which will beg the question of 90% of the time, what do you even do? And that's by design. I don't expect them to take the meeting when I ask. I expect them to ask me what we're doing. This puts me in the driver's seat. And I can say, well, yeah, thank you for asking. I'd love to tell you about it. Um, so that's how we handle the call. And 
don't overcomplicate it. Like if you have the name of someone who's referred you to them, it does not take a lot of words to get that person's attention. So don't sell with more than you need to actually sell it. Cool, Q&A. Um, how much time do I have for Q&A? Um, you've got six minutes. Perfect. OK, um, I saw you first. Yeah, so my most successful one is also one that's been banned, but is um, the most successful breakup email was just a frowny face. It's a frowny face, and then the well, the whole email was actually tied it all together really, really well, um, and it was I think our best performing one. But there's <laughs> some people didn't like it, and so we stopped. Um, but yeah, subject lines. What else? It depends on the strategy, kind of. You know, like if there's something. Yeah. But there's not really a hard and fast rule to it, only that it needs to be dramatically different than what has not worked so far in the sequence with this particular individual. Thanks for that question. What was your experience with voicemails? How many left and how many? What are your thoughts? So voicemails, I would leave. So this is. Uh, are you talking about referrals specifically or just like my philosophy on voicemails overall? Yeah. Okay, so my philosophy on voicemails overall is I will leave a couple throughout the duration of a sequence. One at the very beginning when you're doing, like at the Egoji sequence, you're like going full bore. You're pulling everything out. You have your customized email. You have a phone call. You have LinkedIn. You have a voicemail. You just like, you want to get your name heard by that person because it will increase the effectiveness of the rest of the sequence. Um, and then halfway through, we'll do it as well. One cool way to use voicemail is to make that the subject line of your next series of emails to say, hey, just following up on my voicemail works surprisingly well. Um, for me, with voicemails, I don't overcomplicate it, I keep mine real short. I get a lot of responses that way. Um, short. Um, well, I will say, hey, this is Sam with Outreach. Um, give me a call back at 206-489-8248. Sometimes we'll do longer ones. Sometimes we'll do shorter ones. I've had most success with the shorter ones. Sometimes they haven't even seen my email, but even if they just call me back, um, like your odds of actually getting a meeting. People just, if they call you, they're very unlikely to hang up on you. Or it's a lot harder. And so any kind of callback is actually really effective. Still mentioning the company, like your company's yeah. Like yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, any kind of callback, you just get, you usually get enough time to articulate value clearly enough to, to get a meeting if you do it right. Cool. Yeah. What do you do if one the rep has submit for anonymity, but now you have validated that it's the right person? Um, or the person doesn't care that the the IP address is where they are. Um so if they ask for anonymity? No, and they're like, I know this person is the one in charge. Yeah. So we'll still use the same strategy. We'll still use the referral sequence, but I'll just say one of your reps who's, who asked to be anonymous would like this, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's, that's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's how I handle that. Thank you for that question. Have you ever explored going cross-department for Have I ever explored going cross-department? We haven't really needed to just because we sell to sales and we get enough from sales reps. Actually, when I was in... Before Outreach, I had started my own company, and we were selling to executive directors of funeral homes. That's a whole other story. But um, funeral homes and assisted living communities. And actually, I would get referrals from the salespeople to the other departments, and it worked pretty well. Um, I can't speak from a SaaS perspective. I can tell you from like my wacky college startup perspective, that salespeople were still willing to help out salespeople across departments. So anyway, if, you want, if anyone wants to try that out, let me know how it goes. Um, we have time for maybe one more. Um, if you're or, or writing a, an Egoji sequence, is that what you call it? 
Yeah, the Agoji sequence. In parallel with like, you know, your other sequences, is there a specific strategy around how you go about ordering them? I'm thinking like if you get a referral from someone, but the person you're trying to reach out, reach, reach out to initially tells you no before the person gives you the referral, um, like I don't know if that's like a situation you'd want to avoid or if you would go after the, 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 the Agoji or like the, the referral sequence first and then sequence the the main or like the decision maker first and like later, if it makes sense. So, so which sequence would have priority? The, the Agoji sequence, let that play out, or the referral sequence yeah. in the case where there's both. Okay, so first of all, in the Agoji sequence, if somebody responds, they're kicked out of the sequence. So if they've picked up the call or they've responded, they're already kicked out. If you're choosing between the two, referral every time. Like the Agoji sequence is the best cold outbound sequence. Once you have someone's name referring you to them, you kick them out and put them in the referral, 100%. Yep. OK. One more. Are we, are we done? All right, cool. One more. Who's it going to be? Well, so you get the referral, you make the call right away. Yeah. You said that you would never start with a value prop or anything like that. You just say, hey, Jim, just told me to give you a call. Well, yeah. You recommended we connect. So we. Yes, okay, so the question was, hey, well, when you're reaching out to someone you've gotten a referral to, you don't start out with the value prop right away. You always start with that person's name. And the answer is yes. And the reason that the answer is yes is because you're much more likely to keep them on the phone to actually get into a discussion where, he, where they're listening um, to get into that conversation. You want to leverage that first to give you a better chance at getting that. But good question. A bit counterintuitive, but really important. All right. Awesome. I say Sam, you say Nelson. Sam! Nelson! 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 Woo -hoo -hoo! Um, it's, it's so funny. So we have a